yeah, the message finally come through right over there turning into Australian waters, uh, you need to deploy. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your that was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where you know you're going to humans quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to you screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, or what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. Bruce McLennan was a squadron sergeant major in the Special Air Service Regiment. He joined the SAS in 1984 and served in Afghanistan. He was also involved in the boarding of MV Tampa in 2001. I spoke with Bruce about his long career in Australian Special Forces. I'm Alex Lloyd, speaking on Zoom today with Bruce McLennan. Bruce, welcome to Life on the Line. Thanks very much, Alex. Bruce, can we go back to your childhood and early years? Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Born in Ivanhoe, Victoria, 1961, and spent all of my youth uh, in Victoria for the most part. I had a great upbringing in every sense. It was great. Not really into school, mostly the sports. So state uh, champion in uh, little athletics and uh, long distance running. For the most part, it was just footy, athletics, running, and that's pretty much it. I didn't really like school much. And do you have any military history in the family? Uh, mainly from a little bit in the First World War, some in the Second World War. A great uncle was killed up in uh, Papua New Guinea, buried in Ley. Uh, I've been lucky enough to go and uh, visit his site in Ley, so it was great. Otherwise, no, no other real military family history. So when did the military, I guess, start to enter your consciousness as something you might be interested in or eventually a career option? I lived in Dubbo for a year. Uh, 1975, and I applied for an army apprenticeship in 1975, uh, being not academically inclined, uh, failed that. So uh, literally as soon as I turned 17, applied to join the army and uh, was successful in 1978. And what was it about the army that appealed to you? I think everything. I was very keen on uh, rabbit trapping, shooting, duck shooting, shooting. And the army was going to let you do some shooting, yeah. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, no, that that really held a a big sway towards where I was going to go, I think. Okay, so we've just sort of finished up our time in Vietnam and there was quite a strong backlash by the public in general towards the conflict as we reached the end of it. From what you say about your lack of inclination at school, I take it that sort of greater political context wasn't really on your mind at the time, just the appeal of the day job was interesting to you. True, yeah. Had no uh, negative connotations of Vietnam or the Vietnam veterans or anything else. Just wanted to be a soldier. And then you join at what is the beginning of what's called the long peace after Vietnam. It's well over a decade before we're doing anything else again. And, you know, operations will later pick up with peacekeeping things like Rwanda and Somalia and so on. But then you're just having a long period of being a soldier, I guess. What was it like in that oh, those early years of doing your training and mastery of your basics and all that when we had no deployments on the horizon, no conflicts? Tell me about the sort of the early few years in the army for you. So I served uh, six years in the 6th Battalion, Royal Australian Regiment up at Inogra. So they were the days when uh, we were still doing two, three months at a time on exercise. So to go out in the field for a couple of months with a battalion wasn't unusual. And that was just part of the, the learning curve. So all exciting, 17, 18, 19 year old boy living the boy's dream, carrying weapons and various types of weapons and, uh, you know, going to the range and shooting. Not so much the drill, but we had to do that. Lots of courses in the army, you know, regimental signalers course, snipers course, parachuting courses. So Again, for a young fellow, all great fun. A real, just joyous, carefree existence, just getting on with life. I'd have done it for nothing. (laughs) And then what first drew your eye towards the Special Air Service Regiment? What was the timeline to that? That's an interesting question. I suppose uh, we did an exercise up at Shoalwater Bay and um, there happened to be an SAS SAS Warren Officer. Uh, we, we bumped into at an air landing field, we'd uh, just come in and there happened to be a, a, a lot of SAS fellows or about a troop's worth sitting on the ground not far from us. I didn't know anything about the SAS at that stage. And um, we spent a couple of days with this warrant officer and he told us a lot more about it. And those guys had parachuted in free fall and we thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Wouldn't mind doing that. So uh, 
not long after that, you know, sort of find it a little bit more. It was quite a secretive unit, so the information wasn't that freely uh, given, but found it enough to go, yeah, that's probably where I want to be. And then what was the process like from that? Uh, the initial uh, selection was uh, done at Inogra, so we did all the testing uh, at Inogra. Um, that was fine. Selection over here in Perth, uh, 1984, up at uh, Bindoon, around the surrounding areas and then down at the, the Stirling Ranges. I think that all selections are, are, are difficult, particularly the last lucky dip phase. You know, I'm not sure why they put lucky in there. I'm lucky if you finish, I suppose. You don't really always know what to expect, even though nowadays we have a lot of information on what's going to happen. When you're doing it with the you know lack of sleep, lack of good uh, food, lack of awareness about what's coming up, um, I still think it, the ones who pass, good luck to them, and the ones who don't, they gave it a good shot. But, yeah, I still think it's uh, quite difficult no matter what year you did it. But also, especially for when you did it, anyone doing it you know, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been an exponential increase in public open source material about selection from books to podcasts, etc. Whereas 84, I don't imagine there would have been much publicly available for you to read up on it. So you would have had no conception of what was being thrown at you and just sort of hard yucca day after day after day, especially when you get you know, the incredible loneliness of Happy Wanderer, unless you like that, or then, yes, the relentlessness of Lucky Dip. You just you know, never knowing what's coming next, whereas now these days sort of had a bit more familiarity with the structure. Yeah, we had no idea. Literally didn't even know when it was going to finish, didn't count the days because we didn't know. Yeah, so it was different. But again, that that's part of the appeal, I suppose. And uh, when it does come to the end, you go, wow, that's it. And uh, now we see whether I pass or fail. Quite interestingly, while uh, we were doing selection, they actually made a movie called The Battle for the Golden Road. Towards the end of it, uh, at the end of the selection course, they did a scene where they were um, saying whether you'd done well and you'd passed or you hadn't done well and you'd failed. And just before I was my time to go in there to, to find out whether I passed or failed, they delayed my entry for about 12 minutes. The watch was on. Unbeknown to me, um, they wanted to have someone who had passed, but they told them that in, in no uncertain terms that they'd done very poorly and were probably going to fail. At some stage, the director must have put his hand across the throat to go, right, I cut. The OC uh, then turned around and said, congratulations, you've passed. I thought through that the entire session that I'd failed and uh, that was the end of me. So that was a funny little interlude in the, on the selection. And so you'll spend the rest of the 80s sharpening your skill sets, doing more drills and learning a vast array of new skill sets. Yeah, I was an air operator, so parachuting operations was uh, mine. I also did uh, water operations, but didn't serve in water ops troops. I just stayed in the air ops. And what was that like the first time you were jumping out of a plane? Good. I actually did my free fall course in the battalion, so I was very lucky. I was in the recon sniper platoon uh, in 6th Battalion, so uh, we were lucky. We had a, a great battalion support. We got to do a lot of courses, so my free fall insertion uh, training was actually done prior to going into the regiment, which cut down some time for training, uh, and I got, I got to do other things instead. Then as we hit the 1990s, as alluded to earlier, Australia starts ramping up some overseas military obligations. When these start to get underway, does that sort of prick your interest of, well, there might be a deployment opportunity here and I get to test these skill sets outside of Australia? Very much. Um, that would have been on everyone's mind. You must remember most of those deployments were very small, you know, maybe five guys, six guys, maybe one-offs. So a lot of them uh, were very short duration. So if you got picked uh, and I wasn't picked, um, you were very lucky. So th there literally was, a, you know, probably uh, 20, 30 guys maybe in that uh, period that actually deployed the rest of us, stayed home and uh, continued doing what we were doing. What sort of motivates you to keep doing the hard job day in, day out over so many years? Do you still have that young soldier's love of I do this for free mentality? That stayed with me right up until I got out, that sort of mentality. The world's been uncertain for a long time. Uh, there was no question that we might not go somewhere. So the training was realistic. Counter-terrorist operations, I was a senior instructor in the counter-terrorist wing for a couple of years. I suppose there was always that thought, yep, something will happen. And of course it did in the, in the long term, but there was never any uh, guarantee that nothing was going to happen. So we trained, I, I'm convinced we were the best trained uh, non-combatant soldiers on the planet. We, we trained intensively always. We stuck with the principles. Uh, we stuck with the, with the basics the whole time and um, we we're just always waiting for the job. Well, you mentioned how realistic the training is, and that is seen vividly in June 1996. We've just passed the 25-year anniversary of that tragic uh, Black Hawk disaster. And it's been described to me before by Tim Curtis, and I can imagine for someone like yourself who was in the regiment for so long, what an impact that event would have had on the morale of the 
unit as a whole. Yeah, a very sad time. One of the blokes who died in there, he happened to be my signaller. And I'd, I'd been away on a, a training course and come back and he'd transferred over to the counter-terrorist squadron to get some time online, which he uh, always wanted to do. I'd just had a son three days prior to the event and um, we were driving home. Uh, my pager went off. I called up the unit and they said, you better come back in. There's been an accident in Townsville. Went back into the unit and uh, there were a number of senior officers there and uh, they needed a counter-terrorist force raised that night. So myself and another group of senior NCOs and senior corporals um, went down to the Q store and draw all our equipment and weapons and all the rest of it and then spent the rest of the night and for the next three weeks getting the skills back up to speed to make sure that the counter-terrorist ability hadn't decreased. So the Prime Minister was able to say literally the next morning that it had been resurrected and, and it was true, it was a very high-powered uh, capability that had been raised with the experience of all the men who were involved. So interesting times. And also quite a display of your commitment to the job there too, leaving a newborn behind to answer the call and do that. That's what the regiment was all about. That's what the, the regiment still is about. They do what they need to do and uh, they do it well. And then in 1999, Australia also makes a commitment to Timor. Did you ever find yourself over in Timor at all? No, I was uh, lucky or unlucky enough to go to the parachute school as an instructor for a couple of years while Timor was uh, going on. Towards the end of that uh, tenure, uh, October 1999, I uh, was called back to the regiment to take up position as squadron sergeant major of 3 SAS squadron. The intent was to go deploy to Timor. September 11 occurred. And that uh, kiboshed that plans and other things occurred after that. Before we get on to 9-11, Bruce, there is another significant notable incident in Australian political history as it becomes rather a turning point in national policy on this. And while I'm not going to jump into the politics in particular, it'll be noted that this is the 20-year anniversary this August of what's known as the Tampa Affair, where the Howard government refused permission for the Norwegian freighter MV Tampa over 400 rescued refugees on board to enter Australian waters and then the ship enters anyway and the SAS are deployed. So Bruce, can you walk me through your memories of the lead up to that event and then what unfolded from your perspective on deck? For the first time in my SAS career, I was actually I had to go and attend selection as one of the um, selection staff down south and I happened to be with the commanding officer, Gus Gilmore and the regimental executive officer, Grant Walsh, at the time. And we're literally walking behind some of the uh, students going through on selection. The CO's uh, telephone calls, you know, in the middle of the bush, and uh, he stops and five minutes later catches up and he goes, job's on. Of course, I laugh and, yeah, right And he goes, no, I'm serious. And again, yeah, yeah, I laugh and uh, we start, you know, pulling the piss out of him a little bit. He gets another call, he stops, and uh, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, it's, it's false alarm. And we laughed and kept walking. He then gets another call, so this time he's actually had to move to the top of a hill to get better reception. He comes back down and he goes, the job is on and we need to get going. You and I, we need to head back to the, the highway, which was five or six kilometres away, and a vehicle's going to pick us up and uh, we need to, we're deploying. And I, I'm still laughing at that stage going, no, you're joking. And he convinced me he wasn't kidding. So we're running, we left Grant Walsh uh, behind and uh, Gus Gilmore and myself literally running through the bush and uh, run out onto the, the highway and uh, a couple of minutes later, literally one of our cars pulled up and uh, picked us up and uh, he said, you need to call out the CT squadron or the SRO squadron as, as it was called. And I went, wow, there's the first time ever for real being uh, called out. So we deployed hundreds of times over the course of the uh, CT uh, squadron's history, but this was the first uh, real one. So uh, I rung up squadron orderly room to talk to the clerk to call out the squadron and he wasn't convinced I was uh, not sober so I had to convince him I was uh, telling the truth and uh, I was serious and he was to activate the CT squadron so that that occurred and uh, we pulled back up into Swanbourne and um, the squadron assembled and not long after that we headed off out to uh, Pierce Air Base and uh, started deploying. 17 years since first joining the regiment and you finally get to quote unquote do it for real. I'm sure besides the professionalism and all the things you're going through your head that you have to check off as someone more senior and just prepared for an op like this in general, that inner boy within you is going, yes, finally. <laughs> yeah, there would have been a lot of that. We actually didn't know what the job was. So all we knew was that something had occurred. It was real and we were deploying uh, and it wasn't literally until we got back to the regiment where more information was uh, given to the CO. There were obviously senior staff officers deploying from Canberra 
to uh, Perth with the C-130s that were coming across to pick us up. And it wasn't really until we got to the airhead at the Pierce Air Base where we, we started realising, OK, it's Christmas Island. We had one rib and uh, a squadron's worth of fellows and all our equipment. So we knew something was on. We still didn't have the full understanding of MV Tampa as such. We didn't know it was uh, that vessel at the time. We didn't realise uh, anything other than a potentially a ship has been uh, overtaken. Potentially we're going to recover the ship. So uh, quite a long flight, I think three or four hour flight to uh, Christmas Island. We arrived there, it was night, uh, probably around about midnight if I recall. Moved to a, an old warehouse on the, near the waterfront. Uh, always end up in dirty old warehouses and whatever. Obviously a lot more information had come in uh, then. We probably need to remember we do these uh, types of missions all of the time. Water assaults on uh, vessels, whether they're moving, or moving stationary alongside jetties and wars and what have you. So the planning was not overly hard because we'd actually done quite a lot of this. So we realised there's a vessel that's in international waters, potentially it's going to come into Australian waters. If we get deployed, it will be to prevent it from coming into Australian waters. From there, we really didn't have a lot of information on what we're going to do, except keep them out of Australian waters until we get further direction from um, the political masters. So from there, a day or two, maybe two or three days, I don't really recall, it was uh, quite exciting and quite busy, I suppose, and uh, everyone was sleep deprived. Yeah, the message finally comes through right over there, turning into Australian waters, uh, you need to deploy. So the uh, Water Ops Troop, who are obviously the subject matter experts in uh, shipboarding in in all conditions and what have you, they deployed uh, on the ribs and the rest of the squadron, we deployed on uh, slow barges out to the uh, tamper and were met at the entry points by the water operators who'd actually secured the ship. So you're in one of the slow barges <laughs> what's next do you crawl your way towards the ship yes very slowly you know probably doing 10 15 knots or something but it was quite slow it took a while to get out there so yeah we we're in constant communications with the uh, water ops troop reasonably benign uh, entry literally the norwegians had uh, boarding ladders set out into the entry points onto the vessel so we were met by the uh, crew who were uh, exceptionally happy to see shook everyone's hand as they were boarding and Obviously, the water operators going to all the key uh, uh, locations on the vessel to secure the vessel to make sure that uh, nothing untowards is happening, and nothing was. It was uh, quite benign. But still something quite exciting just for someone who's waited so long to have a quote-unquote real operation. What then happens next, I guess, because you're getting on this vessel that's overloaded with refugees, which in the press are reported to me malnourished and so on. Besides the crew the handful of crew very happy to see you. What are the next stages that you're witness to? So the headquarters group made their way to the bridge um, with some of the uh, other operators. At that stage, the ship was entering Australian waters. Uh, the captain, Captain Rennie, he uh, said, you know, I'm not, I'm not steering the ship. We're going into the Australian port. So under their guidance, uh, I managed to start steering the ship back out to uh, out to sea, outside of Australian waters, where we stayed for a protracted period of time. The crew were nothing but helpful. As I said, it wasn't. Uh, it was a reasonably benign activity. The medical support that we took on board, so Dr. Graham Hammond and uh, the squadron medics, were fantastic in uh, their attention to you know the 433 refugees on board. The assault troops uh, and the bulk of the people on there with the small headquarters on were assault troops were nothing but compassionate, demonstrated empathy with uh, everyone on board, the Afghanis and uh, the crew. There was never any likelihood of anything being uh, untowards. It was uh, regain the initiative, let's stop the chaos. What's for real, what's not real? So we could uh, report straight back to the political masters instantaneously of what was true, what's not true, and uh, where do we go from here? Thankfully, nothing major or dramatic does occur in this part of proceedings. And what you describe is quite benign. But then when you're undergoing this at the time, are you realising that this is going to become such a name that 20 years later, people look back on and see as a political turning point in regards to some of our foreign policies? Not really at the time. So internet wasn't, uh, what, what, there was no internet. So we didn't have mobile phones with uh, access to anything. Our information was more outgoing information to the Prime Minister and the, the Department of Prime Minister and obviously to senior uh, military personnel. We weren't receiving much information back with regards to this is a, a major political issue, you know, don't be naughty or anything else. There was none of that. We weren't naughty anyway. So, no, it was just a, a straightforward job. We had to keep the vessel out in uh, international waters. We had a, a lot of people who needed some uh, medical assistance, which we gave them. They, uh, you know, dehydrated. They were hungry. They had very poor sanitation facilities. They were using a container, which hadn't been cleaned since uh, they'd been on board the vessel. So uh, our whole 
objective then was how do we make it you know as good as we can with resupply starting to arrive blankets better food more medical support more medical equipment so that was our our real focus there was no you know we better watch our p's and q's or anything like that there was no need for it the guys were exemplary in their uh, behavior it was just a, a good job it's compassionate humanitarian aid and how long is it until you're back home so we stayed on the tampa for five or six days oh, i think it was five or six days i really don't recall the uh, hms menorah then uh, steamed up to where we were i cross transferred uh, onto the uh, hms menorah to work with the navy on uh, loading all of the afghan refugees onto the uh, menorah from the tampa we then commenced steaming towards the northern coast of Australia. Again, we weren't really privy to everything. We were just looking after these people uh, with the assistance of the Navy. Probably not many people know, but about three days into that, we uh, intercepted another vessel that had uh, about 250 Iraqi uh, refugees on a sieve. So we actually picked those people up and brought them on board the menorah as well. So it wasn't just one uh, lot of refugees on the vessel, it was two. They were kept uh, separate. Um, just for ease of logistics reasons uh, inside the uh, hull of the HMAS menorah. And then we got relieved about four or five days into that portion of the trip by uh, another SAS troop who helicoptered out from Darwin. And we cross-ported back to Darwin and then uh, spent a night there and then flew back to Perth. And you undertake this operation with a previous guest of the show, I believe, a young Ben Pronk. Ben Pronk was the uh, water troop uh, commander who then had a very successful SAS career. So yes, he was the assault commander of the water ops troop that first boarded. The one steaming ahead of you while you were slowly, very slowly making your way to the ship. <laughs> and they never let us forget that either. Tell me your memory, Bruce, of 9-11. Uh, sitting at home, playing with a, a new computer, uh, obviously very rudimentary. Uh, my wife was watching television. She called me in and she said, look, uh, a plane's accidentally just hit one of these towers in New York. Uh, I was watching it whether we watched the second uh, aircraft uh, impact onto the second tower. She turned and said, your life will never be the same. And about 20 minutes later, um, my pager went off, went into work deployed a couple of days later for six months to Brisbane. So the counter-terrorist force shifted from the West Coast to the East Coast to be a little bit closer to the uh, centre of gravity, I suppose. And it was about four months into that deployment, we were notified that we were, we were the next cab off the rank to go to Afghanistan. So at the end of the six months, we uh, spent five days in Perth, basically refitting with equipment to deal with the harsh Afghan climate and uh, then deployed overseas to Afghanistan. So I saw the family for five days in 12 months. Well, Bruce, it's interesting that we have 17 years of your SAS career, high to professionalism, yes, but not getting to exercise those skill sets in a real operational deployment setting. Then you have the Tampa incident as a little taster in August 2001, then September 2001, obviously the 9-11 terror attacks. And then as you've just alluded to here, the first deployment we had to Afghanistan, the SAS deployment in 2002. How did you feel at sort of going from this massive suddenly ramp up from 17 years of home base to suddenly while being deployed to the middle east that must have been mind-blowing very exciting for everyone involved we were lucky we had a couple of months notice one squadron who was the first squadron to go over there had a lot less time uh, notice than what we did so we had an opportunity at least to telephone and uh, you know talk to our families prior to going uh, having said that five days back in perth and it was really refitting you know very little time just the night time of the families prior to going yeah, very exciting and uh, knowing that we are in our prime with regards to training, exceptionally well-led, well-equipped. You know, they have truckloads of fantastic cold weather gear and uh, weapon systems and very exciting and uh, just a great opportunity and a good job. Enjoyed it. It also must take a toll then on the family life, just obviously the military lifestyle, there's an expectation of being away from family for extended periods. And I imagine of your career, you're already kind of used to that with the months, you know, away on exercise you've described before, but just the short notice before doing a big overseas deployment like that, it's not just a testament to your commitment, but also that of your partner. A very true comment. The families really do suffer a lot. So my wife, her father died while I was deployed over there. So I only spoke to it a couple of weeks prior to him uh, passing away. And I didn't speak to her again for a couple of weeks until after he passed away. So exceptionally hard, the, the fellow, she she's married, you know, he's gone, can't even talk to me type thing. So yes, it is hard. It's a bit different now. Communications are a lot easier, a lot better, a lot smarter. But yeah, and it's still tough, you know, you're saying goodbye to someone for six, eight months, 12 months. 
looking back on that Afghanistan deployment, what were some of the major highlights to you? Is there any particular moments, times out in the field that stand out to you? I think the guys' attitudes, we didn't know anything about Afghanistan, you know, literally what we're finding out from intelligence staff or, you know, what we can glean from the limited uh, internet that we have got. Just the guys' attitude to, you know, we need to go out there. We were very much in strategic reconnaissance mode versus strike, so we were out there in small groups, five-man patrols, observing targets from, you know, any distance away to find out what we needed to know. So very much a, a strategic asset for the US command. They didn't have a, a similar group who, would, who could deploy literally for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks without being sustained by uh, very limited helicopter resources and what have you. The guy's attitude, there was not even one single punch up, you know, in six months amongst, you know, 120 Australian blacks. You've got to go, that's a record. 68 guys lived in one room with their ammunition, their weapons, their missile systems, four plastic porta potties, you know, that's it for for all of us to use, you know, when we are back in our bag room. For the most part, we were out in the field, which was great. Great experience all around. True Australian character that you've read about in all the boys' own books and all the rest of it and from the previous wars. They were all true, the, the larrikin humour, the practical jokes. That was fantastic. And you get to really embody that David Sterling original model of, the say, the British SAS and doing that out there in another desert, although a very different era. I can imagine the sort of very professional focus on the job, but that kind of pride in, well, we're actually you know, overseas representing our country doing this high level order of operations precipitated by a huge international event that is 9-11, it would have given you all quite a unifying sense of purpose. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah, we had a a goal and that was to provide uh, that intelligence to anyone who had a reason to use it or employ it. You know, if something was uh, not right, something was wrong, there were Taliban presence or whatever. Uh, we got to travel over a lot of the country, you know, Paktika, Patia, Nangahar province, Kost, all over uh, the eastern side in Pushtun uh, tribal land. Literally nothing could have prepared us for how they live, education system or lack of it, their lack of uh, support network. You know, the only electricity in the village was probably a little one horse generator that powered the PA system to the mosque. So the call to prayer five times a day, everyone else literally would have a small tin with, uh, you know, some animal fat in there and a, a piece of material off their clothing. And that, that was their candle. So, yeah, it was very much a culture shock, but uh, all good to uh, learn at the same time. Where does your military career take you after that, Bruce? I stayed for about another year in that role and then I went to the development cell in uh, regimental headquarters for 18 months and I discharged in 2004, late 2004. Went overseas, going back to Afghanistan with the United Nations actually for two years where I worked with Tim Curtis and a number of other ex-SAS fellows. Then I went on to Iraq for another two years working for a, a large uh, American engineering firm over there, rehabilitating um, sewage treatment plants, water treatment plants and such. Then Mongolia for a year and a half. And then I thought I'd better come home and uh, see the family. And uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I got wrapped uh, back in, into the army, back into the regiment for an 18-month contract. Completed that and then went back overseas into various countries, more in the mining industry and the health, safety and security side of the house. So 20 years with the regiment, you discharge quite a varied international career there. And the Tim Curtis reference, I'm guessing that's the Afghan parliamentary elections of 05. That's where I worked with Tim. Uh, I was in Afghanistan prior to that, uh, down in Jalalabad as, uh, with the United Nations UNOPS as a field security officer for their engineering arm. And how did you find this variety of international work? Because it's obviously then going to be a bit of a wider lens focus than what you were doing with the regiment. Was that a new challenge or new range of challenges you enjoyed? You gain a better appreciation of um, bureaucracy and how bad it can actually (laughs) influence uh, something or delay something from occurring. So working with the UN, you got to look at USAID, JapanAid, AusAid, the Afghan government, the United Nations in general and their various umbrella organisations uh, within it. Some were very effective and very good. Some were exceptionally poor. And uh, yeah, it was a bit sad, actually, seeing some of the bureaucracy, you know, we, for instance, we ordered some GPSs for the engineers and six months later, they said, you know, totally wrong item, didn't actually perform the role and we had to send it back. And in the end, we're buying them on our breaks and bringing them back and trying to get reimbursed from the UN to, to supply the engineers with appropriate gear. So you saw both sides, you know, good and bad. Uh, unfortunately, I think in some cases a lot more bad than good. So would you rate the ADF bureaucracy as more efficient than the UN? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yep. And what was the 18-month contract you had back with the regiment down the road? 
Uh, so I went back in as the what they call the SMS, a subject matter air, air operations. So I looked after, you know, their parachuting planes, helicopters for roping activities, exercises. Uh, went into a, another squadron for six months as an operation officer and then did a final tour of Afghanistan as the deputy commander of 125 men Indigenous counter-terrorist force based out of uh, Turincot and Uruzgan. I guess, how do you look back on all those years in the Middle East, Bruce? It's been a very turbulent two decades and we're at this point we're recording this in july 2021 so we've just you know we've seen final australian troops withdraw from afghanistan we're seeing taliban sadly retake some large portions of the country it's been such a volatile two decades and you've sort of seen it from the start in effect and then you've been back over there in a variety of contexts how do you reflect on the journey i guess we've taken with afghanistan in a sense over the past 20 years Unfortunately, I think uh, we've made a mistake and we didn't learn from history. If you can imagine a place that has, you know, 10,000 valleys and there's people living in all of those 10,000 valleys, and we think we're going to change something without committing literally trillions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of people, including construction and all the rest of it, to develop it into a place where they go, well, we don't need the Taliban because we've got infrastructure, we've got transportation, we've got education, uh, we've got natural resources to exploit. Well, we didn't do any of that. So we built a couple of roads that cost, you know, 10 times more than what they would here. A few schools, that a lot of them got blown up prior to them uh, even being employed and we didn't uh, sustain the Afghani so they could stand on their own two feet without massive influx of money and uh, weapon systems and uh, leadership. When that's all now gone, it's going back to how it was prior to us going there. And uh, unfortunately, it'll get a lot worse before it gets better. What do you look back on as the favourite aspect of your service? You know, was it just the constant exercises and getting to live that boyhood dream? Was it a particular deployment or just was it it's a cliche, but the classic, just iconic Aussie mateship of service and brotherhood? That's certainly uh, a major part of it. You know, the people you work with, the battalion, you had a million different types of characters. You know, there's 600 odd people in the battalion, a lot bigger than the regiment. But the regiment equally had the same fellows who were just you know, potentially a bit more committed or a bit more driven to obviously earn the beret. I really liked it all. As I keep saying to everyone, every day was a good day. Even the bad days were good days. I just enjoyed it. Enjoyed the system, uh, which I probably needed as a young fellow. I was probably a bit wayward. So uh, having a, a good form structural system, you know, we were well led, uh, not always well equipped, but that's certainly changed now. They are an exceptionally well equipped army. Have no reason to believe they're not still well led. I know Angus Campbell, the you know chief of the Defence Force, uh, Rick Burt happened to be involved in the Tampa affair. He was actually on Christmas Island with us. Uh, he's the chief of the army. He was also one of my troop commanders, squadron commander, and regimental commander. So you know, these are just good people. The soldiers were great. And what are you doing with yourself today, Bruce? You're obviously back home in Perth and not travelling all over the world, leaving COVID aside. Well, I've just finished three years in Iraq, so uh, I'm not going overseas anymore. I've decided uh, that's enough of that. So I'm actually working for Wally Walsh, who was the RXO when the attempt affair occurred and we were down on selection. I'm actually working for him, doing a bit of coaching and mentoring at um, various Rio Tinto sites up in the uh, Pilbara in Western Australia here. Well, Bruce, it has been quite a varied career and a very insightful conversation. Thank you for coming on Life on the Line to share your story with me today. Alex, more than welcome. Thanks very much for having me. That was my conversation with Bruce McLennan. We have recorded a variety of SAS stories on this podcast. For more about the 1996 Black Hawk disaster, listen to number 101, Bob Hunter. Unfortunately, we had two choppers come together and crash. The art of leadership in these things is, okay, so what do you do now when everything has gone to hell in a handbasket? For more on Ben Pronk and Tim Curtis, you can catch the Season 3 episode, SAS Leadership, with Ben Pronk and Tim Curtis. I distinctly remember thinking, I wish I didn't know them quite as well because I knew each of their wives, I knew all of their kids, and I remember thinking, if there is a 50 caliber machine gun on that vessel and it has a, a shot at that helicopter, then not all of us will be coming home. And it was a quite a, a sort of moving moment. Right at the 11th hour, so just before we were about to launch, we had a call with the Prime Minister who said, go ahead and seize the ship. And then in Season 4, SAS Leadership, Volume 2. This is the zenith of resilience that you want to aspire to, where you are essentially bulletproof to whatever life throws at you. 
guys raced into burning helicopters with detonating explosive charges and ammunition and pulled people out of the wreck. For more about the 2002 SAS deployment to Afghanistan, be sure to watch on our YouTube channel the documentary video episode, Life After Service, Tony Park. I'm just lucky, you know, so when I hear the stories of veterans who are struggling, even today, of people who've attempted suicide and those whose lives have been lost, unfortunately, I can see how it's happened and, and how real the problem is. Our most recent two modern SAS-themed episodes focus on two new books. The first is a memoir, Survivor, Life in the SAS, which you can find out more about in number 28, Mark Wales, Volume 2. A war like that will turn good men bad and bad men evil. The second book is the world's best blueprint to building greater personal resilience, called The Resilient Shield. You can catch my chat with the three authors earlier this season in... SAS Resilience with Dr. Dan Pronk, Ben Pronk, and Tim Curtis. These kind of things needed to be programmed into muscle memory because we know that when you are under significant stress and we were training these medics to go into combat environments. This was towards the end of our selection course in a phase called Lucky Dip. When I looked around the gloom as the sun was setting on that particular day, there was a range of people inside that truck that were grossly and profoundly disappointed with the fact that their mind and body layer weren't connected. We're on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at LOTL Pod, and on LinkedIn at Thistle Productions. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Theme music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Closing music, Edge of the World by the externals thanks for listening and lest we forget well he parked his car outside the rose hotel and he headed for the bar and not a wink can ever fess a smile as he motioned for a jar well he ain't been home since 1973 since he was 17 Anyone in sail the seven seas